Namaste and greetings. I, Mahima Kapoor, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evum Niti Anusandhan Samsthan, Nai Delhi, extend a warm welcome to you all to the IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we are gathered for a special talk on the blue economy, port based development, and expanding India's foreign trade as part of the series. The state of foreign trade, hashtag talking trade. This discussion is being organized by the IMPRI Center for the Study and of Finance and Economics and delivered by Professor Mukul Asher. We are honored to have Professor Mukul Asher as the speaker, Dr. Naleen Bharti as the moderator and Professor Prabir Day as the discussant for the session. We welcome you. I feel privileged to introduce the moderator for the session, Dr. Naleen Bharti. Sir is the Associate Professor, Humanities and Social Sciences at the Indian Institute of Technology, Patna. Now, I invite Dr. Bharti to take the proceedings further, and we look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me first introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Mukulji Asar. Uh, uh, obtained his PhD in economics from Washington State University in 1972. Uh, he was a faculty member with the Department of Economics and later with the Lee Kuan Yu School of Public Policy at National University of Singapore for over four decades and stepping down in uh, June 2018. He has been a visiting uh, faculty at the Asian Policy Public Policy Program at the Hitot Subasi University in Tokyo since early 2000. And he is associated with several Indian think tanks, such as the Research and Information System for Developing Country, RIS in New Delhi, where he is a senior adjunct fellow. He is on editorial board of several journals, including IIMB Management Review. His research focuses on public financial management, pension reforms, and on expanding India's geoeconomic and geostrategic space. He has published extensively in national and international journals and has authored or edited more than 16 books, including an e-book on economic reasoning and public policies, case studies from India. He has been a consultant or advisor to several governments in Asia and to multilateral organizations and think tank. Let me also introduce our, uh, our discussant uh, for this event, uh, Professor Prabhid Day. Uh, professor Day is professor at uh, RIS. He is also the coordinator of Asian India Center at RIS. Uh, Day works in the field of international economics and has research interest in international trade and development. He was a visiting fellow of Asian Development Bank Institute, Tokyo, and visiting senior, senior fellow of United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, uh, Bangkok. He has been conducting policy research for the government of India and several international organizations. He has a PhD in economics from the Jadapur University, Kolkata. He has contributed several research papers in international journals and written books on trade and development. He is the editor of the South Asian Economic Journal published by Sage. Before I will invite uh, Professor Mukul Asar, I would like to just uh, briefly introduce the uh, topic today. Uh, the blue economy uh, is an emerging concept uh, which is basically encouraging us for the better utilization of uh, our ocean or blue resources. Uh, similar to the green economy, this particular blue economic model also aims for the improvement of the human well being and the social equity while significantly reducing environmental risk and ecological uh, scarcity. Uh, with, an over, uh, with an over 7,500 kilometer uh, long coastline spread across nine coastal states, 12 major and 200 minor ports, India's blue economy supports 95% of country's business through transportation. And it also contributes an estimated 4% of its gross domestic product. Uh, Professor Oscar is going to discuss uh, 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 in detail about the Sagar Mala project. Uh, so this project launched by the Ministry of Seeping uh, is the 
strategic initiative for the portly development through the extensive use of the IT enabled services for modernization of ports. It tackles the issue of underutilized ports by focusing on port modernization, efficient ev evacuation, and coastal economic development. Considering these facts, uh, uh, we, uh, we now understand that uh, the particular topic which is being discussed today is very important for a country like India, uh, uh, which has lots of opportunity to grow in future. And at the same time, uh, in terms of trade also, uh, India's uh, uh, trade uh, in the global trade is, uh, uh, is not up to the mark. It has to increase uh, uh, because we contribute a large population, but in terms of trade, our contribution to the global trade is very less. So considering these points, uh, now may I invite Professor Mukul Asar uh, for his presentation. Professor yes. Asar. Thank you, uh, Professor Nalin Bharti for your kind introduction uh, and for laying the uh, foundation for the topic for today. I'm also grateful to Impuri, uh, the, direct, the director uh, at Impuri, uh, for considering me for delivering uh, this <clears throat> session. There are three words that we need to link. One is the blue economy. So Professor Bharti has already indicated what blue economy is. We need to elaborate a little bit and define that. Then the port-based development is also uh, related to the coastal areas. If we look at the world, coastal areas are among the more prosperous areas in any country and the port based will permit or make it feasible for coastal areas to grow as well and link these two with foreign trade. Okay, so this is a huge topic. Uh, I have many slides for more complete references uh, for the uh, researchers particularly. Um, I may not go over all the slides, but these linkages, how we pursue them is going to be critical to expand India's share in global economic, not just trade in goods and services, but in global linkages and economic and strategic space. Let me just give the synopsis because the slides are big. Uh, we should get the gist of it first. This figure shows the, you know, we all know that Earth is mostly water, but this figure really brings it out how important the water is uh, on the Earth's surface. And then the, uh, uh, we have only, uh, uh, various countries making up one third of the planet's surface and more than 47% or 43% is, is water. And uh, it, uh, the 43% of Earth's surface falls under international waters requiring law of the sea treaty, which we have done, but we need we don't have so many experts that we need on that. Territorial waters where states have special rights make up 27% of the Earth's surface and Antarctica occupies 2.7%. All the world's countries make up less than one third. So if we look at since independence, we never used the word blue economy until uh, very recently until the Sagar Mala and joining it with Bharat Mala, uh, Udan and the railways uh, uh, came along. Udan is the airspace. It is therefore essential to utilize water endowments productively and sustainably. Uh, because if, if the oceans 
uh, are polluted, uh, that affects India uh, quite a bit uh, as well. And we have not focused so far on the blue economy. And we first explained the recent blue economy initiatives, Sagarmala, and using inland waterways. In the, in the earlier times, there were, we had in some states, excellent inland waterways that made up our trade channels and commercial and passenger channels. But we are developing inland waterways. Uh, the more famous of that is the Namami Ganga project uh, uh, that has received a lot of uh, priority. So we use that to enhance connectivity and to create new economic activities and growth modes. It argues that India's blue economy initiatives should be viewed in conjunction with its Bharat Mala program designed to vastly enhance road connectivity in the country, including with existing and new ports that the roads are being connected. So the logistic cost of international trade gets reduced with rail connectivity, particularly Northeast elsewhere, we are using the rail connectivity too. Um, and the air connectivity program called Udan, which is complementarities among them must be tapped to realize the full potential of port development and coastal communities. We then examine implications of the above programs for accelerating India's external trade basket and some select examples are given. This interrelationship needs to be studied much more intensively. As I was preparing for this talk, I realized how little research on these areas, uh, uh, published research uh, that exist by think tanks or academics. So our discussions, however, still remains broad, but hopefully it's a platform that will encourage researchers and scholars to do more rigorous research. And hopefully those who supervise PhD students and, other, and graduate students uh, will uh, set up the, the topics in this area. Now, when we talk about the blue economy, we need to be mindful where are the world's key maritime chalk points? Um, of course, we, for us, the Straits, Straits of Malacca is among the most important, is Asia's primary choke point, accounting for 25% of all traded goods, third of all seaboard. More than 40% of our trade passes through Straits of Malacca. And this is where we need to pay a lot of attention to Cape of Good Hope uh, and others. There are primary, there are secondary job points as well. Now, how the, you know, India has got very large trade, $1.2 trillion in a national trade in goods and services. Um, but in the shipping hubs, we are still evolving. We are not in the, uh, in the top 10, uh, even in 2019. But, and the shipping hubs don't change so much. 2005, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, in 2019, Shanghai, Singapore, and a lot of Chinese ports have, have come up. Uh, uh, Korean port uh, and, and Rotterdam, okay? So what we need to do, what was Los Angeles, Dubai, Hamburg, European and American ports in 2005 are not in the top in 2019. So one of our ambitions should be that we should come to be ranked uh, within the, at least the top 20, if not top, top 10. Okay. 
this yes, these are India's uh, external economic zone and the continental shelf. Prime Minister explained the blue economy. To me, the blue chakra or wheel in India's national flag represents the potential of blue revolution for the ocean economy. That is how central the ocean economy is to us. So this is where the journey that we have embarked on. Professor Bharti mentioned that blue economy refers to utilization of a country's coastline, inland waterways, sea connectivity globally for more sustainable and broad-based economic development. There is no standard definition of the scope of the blue economy. Professor Bharti gave some data, but some countries, for example, include tourism in the blue economy. So country like Thailand will have a large blue economy because they have a large tourism sector. And we'll see that government of India has set up a task force to try to define what should go in our blue economy because we know what gets measured get done. And we can get, then uh, review the progress as we go along if we set up a good conceptual definition and good record keeping uh, system. The focus is on ports development, which is the Sagar Mala. Bharat Mala is the road connectivity, rail modernization, major airports we have, Navi Mumbai in uh, Maharashtra, Jawar in UP, regional air connectivity, Udan, um, and, and so on. So we need to put it together as a transport. Indeed, a lot of people have, have argued that we should actually have a, should have a transport ministry. There is no need for a separate ministry for different modes of trans road transport and others. Um, but that is part of the political economy, not as easy to, to tackle. Um, it's a lower order priority in reform to have a mega transport ministry. That may come with time. India ranks fourth in the global ranking of air connectivity. And new airports and Udan aim to improve this further. Also, the northeast and uh, north, south, and east west corridors that was started by Prime Minister Bhatpai uh, when he was uh, uh, Prime Minister between 1998 and 2004. Uh, and you can see that this is something that now is beginning to look as if India has got connectivity, north, south, east, west. This is Bharat Mala. This is even more thicker because not everything is in the national program. There are a lot of states and others. So this Bharat Mala program will, when it is completed, will make uh, our connectivity far, far more than what it was before. As I had mentioned, Northeast Economic Corridor is key. It is connectivity to state capitals and key towns. Northeast, we have to develop as a new growth node. Uh, and that new growth node is the one of the ways we will reach $5 trillion economy. There is multimodal freight movement from via seven waterway terminals on river Brahmaputra in, in the Northeast. Um, so, so that connectivity is being uh, announced. There's a coastal and port connectivity routes enabling port-led economic development. 2008-36 KM National Highways Plan, 2000 KM highways to be developed in phase one with a budget outlay of 20,000 crores. Now notice what is being planned is the improved geometry that we are seeing enables high speed connectivity, average of 80 to 100 kilometers per hour. This is about what you can drive. I mean, I 
I lived in America for 12 years. We drove enough. Uh, 800 kilometers per hour would be just fine in an American highway system. So if we can achieve that, that will be considerable achievement for us. Greenfield Corridors 22, to connect 750 plus economic and industrial nodes. This is what we were lacking before, where we had many states, there was only one type of economic corridor like in Karnataka, Bangalore, Mysore, and nothing much else. So now we'll have more and more corridors. They will be connected with each other within the state and outside the state. Multimodal, so rail, waterways, and uh, air uh, logistics terminals uh, uh, in national multimodal logistics master plan. We never had a logistics master plan before, but logistic cost in India are about twice the world average, which I'll show we need to bring it down. Safer freight and passenger movement. You know, how many accidents, others, all that work requires uh, investment and expertise. Additional 8,500 kilometer of green field, new economic corridors and expressways. So good connectivity. Uh, we have connection of economically important production and consumption centers. So you get agglomeration economies as urban economists would say. Um, and you need then, you also get diffusion of talent. Not all talent has to go to four metros and now second tier, third tier, others, that depth of talent will help in local development as well. Uh, there are uh, 25,000 kilometers of highways, 9,000 kilometers of national highways, and 120,000 crore of, of budget. So these are the, the Greenfield corridors will cost 3.3 lakh crores. Um, and there are, these are under construction, 2.3, awarded but not appointed, under bidding. And uh, this is the, the project report stage, 2715. So we are, we are moving fairly rapidly uh, to try to create that connectivity. As of mid-2021, Indian Railway, we shouldn't forget railways, out of 64, 689 km of railway track in India, 71% were electrified. And the others are going to be electrified by 2023. That will be a big, big achievement. Saving in fuel will be very, very important. And railways want to be carbon neutral as well. So railways are undertaking some really path-breaking reforms, including preparing accrual-based accounting methods, not cash-based as other government areas have. What are the areas of operation? Six areas, harvesting of living resources, extraction of non-living resources, and we haven't uh, tapped uh, thermal energy, others, and so on from the sea that we need to do, generation of new resources, trade and commerce, ensuring health of resources, establishing newer routes of trade and commerce through oceans, inland waterways, multimodal transport, uh, increases connectivity, um, and uh, the potential for co and such connectivity was underutilized before. Uh, BIMSTEC uh, initiative has included blue economy in its workplace. The other geostrategic area, geoeconomic and geostrategic concept that is relevant is the Indo-Pacific region. Now, usually we have been talking about Asia-Pacific. Now, Asia-Pacific leaves out Indian Ocean. And so we now have the Indo-Pacific 
region. Uh, it links countries in the Indian Ocean with the Pacific Ocean to form a region. So we have Indo-Pacific incorporates both oceans, and that is increasingly preferred. Quad, US, Japan, Australia, India have adopted it officially. France has uh, used this concept. Germany is coming around to it. So as far as our, you know, when we set up, this is the Indo-Pacific uh, region. Uh, when we set up the thesis topics and research topics in research institution, we should be uh, becoming expert on the Indo-Pacific region because the Asia-Pacific region excluded us. EPEC, for example, uh, Asia-Pacific Economic Organization, when we wanted to become a member, Prime Minister Rao once mentioned, I do not knock on closed doors, referring to our wanting to be a member of EPEC, but the EPEC being reluctant. So we are through Indo-Pacific, we are now creating this new concept, which is very critical for our geoeconomic, geostrategic uh, objectives, and our, our academics and researchers should recognize it. India has advanced its initiative at the East Asia Summit as well. It centers on seven pillars of maritime security, maritime ecology, maritime resources, capacity building and resource sharing, disaster risk reduction and management, science, technology, and academic cooperation and trade connectivity and maritime transport. So the connection of the above with India's blue economy and coastal economic zone is very relevant. I also urge you to uh, look at the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs. It's by a military organization, AIR University of USA. And we should, our Indian researcher should have a reasonable uh, presence in the output of this particular uh, journal. Now, the blue economy, the way it is conceived, is conceived in a very integrated way. So they have identified seven priority areas. Working groups are, uh, were set up, uh, reports are done, and it is being monitored closely. One is the national accounting framework for blue economy and ocean governance priority. So we will have, we are uh, giving emphasis on how to measure blue economy, coastal marine spatial planning and tourism priority. That's the second uh, priority area, marine fisheries, aquaculture, fish processing. And we are going a huge way in the, the fishing uh, schemes that have been set up. Manufacturing, emer emerging industries, trade, technology services, skill development, logistics, infrastructure, and shipping, including transshipment. We do very little transshipment, and our port should be developed more and more that instead of the global cargo going to Colombo and then coming to us, it should be coming to the Indian ports and going to the, to the neighboring countries. Coastal and deep sea mining and offshore energy. These are going to be critical. Uh, security strategic dimensions and international. These are the working groups, national accounting and so on. I've given you all the links. They've got all the reports. We are also using technology for the blue economy. The Indian government has initiated OSMART program under the Ministry of Earth Sciences, budget of 16.2 billion INR. It will provide scientific and technological inputs for various aspects of the blue economy. The inputs include information about fish potential and local weather conditions. It's very important, the local weather conditions. Brazil, for example, 
is an agricultural power in the world. But it has all its agriculture is non-irrigated. But it has got local weather conditions every 15, 20 kilometers. So they know exactly when to harvest, when to do what, when to plant, when, you know, how to do that, because the local weather condition, all India weather condition, okay, is fine, but it is not useful to a farmer in a particular district. What should I do? They need that district level uh, uh, information and advice. So this program would also assist in seaweed cultivation and mangrove growth because those have got huge uh, potential. Sagar Mala was initiated in 2015. 580 project, so it's a project based. Estimated cost of 124 billion USD. They have been identified and to be implemented over 20 years. So it's 15 to 35. It's a long gestation, long project. Projects worth 135 billion INR have been completed by July 2018. That's a very small proportion, but the progress is uh, accelerating. Sagarmala Development Company has been set up to uh, identify port-led development projects, uh, providing equity support for the special purpose vehicles. And given the large number of project, projects, proficiency in structuring in selecting appropriate financing mix and in implementing the projects would be crucial. Each project should consider constituting a strong project management office, PMO, with requisite skill sets and authority for successful completion of the project and the handover. I don't have time to go over project management, but that is a specialized skill. And in our government and in general, in the bureaucracy, project management is not recognized as a professional skill. I, I would urge the research institutes, universities to subsidize their staff getting diploma in project management from Project Management International based in Delhi. They provide certificate diploma programs and that's very, very useful now that we are undertaking such huge number of projects. Uh, as I was mentioning, the CLSA in 2016 estimated that the logistic cost in India are 14 to 17%, and Sagar Mala will bring it down to 6 to 8% in line with globally competitive. Um, and so, if you go more cargo via sea and river routes to a global average of about 40%, compared to 5% around 2015, we can save a lot of cost. And that is something that is being uh, envisaged. So with 2025, with Sagar Mala Initiative, the share of roads will go down from 54 to 46. And the share in container traffic uh, increased to 25% from 18% in base case, and we have rail will increase slightly, coastal will double. This is where huge opportunities in coastal and inland waterways, the Namami Gange project and others, and the pipelines will remain about the same. But main thing is the road. Everything is choked up on the, on the road, and we will now using blue economy means we use coastal and inland waterways, we double their share from uh, within 10 years. Six to eight potential new ports based on three themes. Port saturation, unavailability of ports, and strategic ports to capture international opportunities. So it's all part of India's international uh, integration with the world. 
So these are some of the new ports uh, that are being planned. What is the proposed coastal economic zone? So far, we haven't had much coastal development. Those that we do identify with coast like Mumbai or Cochin uh, or Chennai, uh, they are relatively prosperous, but they are very few. Kolkata, uh, Haldia is uh, still relatively prosperous in the Northeast, but because of bad governance for over half a century, uh, they have not realized their potential. One hopes that they do. And so we got now all these, you can see that these are zones. So surrounding, there will be a lot of uh, opportunities. And uh, if you see Mundra, Kandla is one of the oldest ports. Mundra for a, today is a larger share of the traffic than JNPT. Even though JNPT was set up much earlier uh, and so on, but many public, private, mixed ports, they are all increasing. And the port development and the coastal economic zone is what we are trying to do. Port connectivity enhancement, port linked industrialization and recycling of ships. So 2019 bill was passed and it aims to grow the industry share globally from 30 to 60% in recycling of ships. That's a huge opportunity, but it is also environmentally, we have to be very sensitive about it. There are some of the labor safety issues and others, and it can generate revenue of, of 2.2 billion USD while meeting the international standards and so on. So, so India aims to be compliant with international rules. Promoting sustainable development of coastal communities through skill development and livelihood generation activities, fisheries development, coastal tourism. 65 projects are being, being planned. Initial funding for Sagar Mala has been from the budget and the public sector, but significant crowding in of private sector investment of both domestic and foreign are being anticipated. So if you see the hedge, uh, it doesn't show the hedge here, but oh here, here it is, the hedge. If you see this area, there is a huge investment that are going on. Many by Japanese, there is a, a Dolera investment region, there is SIR uh, region um, and so on. So we will see this coastal, once you have a lot of industries coming up here, you can easily get to any of the ports. You can go to Mumbai, but you can also go to Pipa or Mundra or Sikka or Kandla or small one, Daej and Azira port as well. So the, so that is, and similarly, one hopes it happens in the South and the East. And the East will particularly benefit uh, like Andhra, uh, you know, doesn't have much uh, uh, breadth of locations where active in economic activity is intense. So now with Vizag and Kakinda and so on, we'll have more of that activity coming, uh, coming in. So India is also, Try planning infrastructure plans in Andaban and Nicobar of our island as part of the blue economy. So we are planning transshipment center terminal at Campbell Bay and so on. Uh, Chennai, Andaban, Nicobar Island submarine cable project is being done with a view to enhancing air connectivity infrastructure for civil flights are, is increasing and the solar plan for energy security is coming in. India is also participating in 
uh, port development abroad. So Jabar port in Iran, right now, because of what's going on in Afghanistan, we have to wait and see how its linkage with Afghanistan will work out. But India-Iran is very significant and uh, for our economic and diplomacy in the central, in central uh, Asia. We also have port initiatives in Myanmar, another very strategically critical country for us. And we assume responsibilities for operation as Sitavi port in 2019. India, Bangladesh port initiatives are there and a lot of trade is uh, going on uh, uh, there as well. Same thing with India, Maldives. Now there is a ferry service between India and Maldives as well. India, Indonesia. Indonesia is a key Indo-Pacific country and they are jointly developing maritime cooperation uh, and they have signed uh, agree agreements uh, for that. I've already mentioned the uh, Inland Waterways Authority of India. They plan a substantial development of multimodal uh, rural facilities, ferry services, navigation, uh, aids, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and the multimodal terminal will be Varanasi, Saib Ganj, and Haldia. So there are a lot of activities already taking place. One example, Chennai port has also been shipping cars in rural vessels to people port in the state of Gujarat, saving time and consumption. Instead of going by road, go by sea, not much traffic, you can go faster. I won't give you too many examples uh, in here. You can really read that. Namami Gange project is now well known with a lot of attention. And there are ferry services in Ganga. There are now Ganga water is very clear near Kashi, Varanasi, uh, and Prayagraj. Uh, and we are going to see more and more connectivity improving livelihoods of people in the Gangetic Basin. We saw that's where the demographic uh, uh, weight uh, is. Now let's look at the foreign trade. So we, we have given you some overview of the blue economy, Sagar Mala, along with Bharat Mala and others. Uh, we saw the linkages. You can't do Sagar Mala without Bharat Mala and without Udan and without railways contributing and the inland waterways contributing. These are all interconnected, integrated transport uh, uh, corridors. Now let's look at some numbers first about, we, we leave out intra-EU trade. Total global merchandise exports were 15.45 billion, uh, 15,462 billion USD. India was 2019, share was only 2.1%, ranked 13. In imports, um, we were ranked eight. Um, merchandise trade deficit was 160 billion, but in trade in services, we ranked fifth, share of 4.3% in exports, and seventh in imports with share of 3.8%. But then we had a $36 billion surplus in services. So our role should be to sustainably re reduce our merchandise trade deficit, increase our services deficit, and the blue economy will help in both of them. We are increasingly setting up, uh, notice though that the total trade X plus M in merchandise and services was 1200 billion USD. The figures that I see for 2021 so far suggest that we will exceed 1200 billion this year. So we are not small in terms of our international trade and we shouldn't 
sort of mentally think that, oh, it's small, we don't need to pay attention. We need to, and we need to. We have increasingly ambitious targets, USD 4 billion for 21, 22 in merchandise exports alone, 500 for 22, 23, and 1000 billion over next five years or so. So, so that is, uh, uh, that is really a very, very ambitious set of targets that we need to uh, work on. Now, let's look at the sectoral export. One is the agriculture exports. In 2019, agriculture exports were 37 billion, uh, and in share in import was 5.5%. We had a modest surplus of 10. Point Three billion, but this is where, if India wants to increase its soft power and become more and more relevant to the world, India must become an agricultural. India already is in the top ten for the first time in the agricultural exports with three point one percent share, but we need to go much much more than that. Top rice exporters. Um, in uh, uh, 2019 were India, 33%. Distant is Thailand, 20%, and Vietnam, 12%. So now we need to work on rice exports. We can work on the other agricultural exports. Um, the, we are the third largest cotton exporter. But in the largest traded agri product, soya beans, we have a meager share. And that's where we hopefully these sagarmala and so on can help. In meat and edible meat of all category, we ranked eight in the world with 4% share. Another area where we can, uh, we can grow our share. But India lost its share in wheat and maslin, and we don't figure in the top 10 anywhere. In agricultural imports, we all know the main items are cooking oil, uh, and we, need, we are using blue economy uh, to reduce our uh, dependence on the imported uh, cooking, cooking oil. It should be noted that top agricultural exporting countries have processed agriculture item as the key source of exports. So this is an area where the blue economy by encouraging food processing near ports and coastal areas can help India move up the global ranking. So you process uh, frozen vegetables, fruit. India is a huge producer of horticulture, 340 million tons, uh, and we can, if we process it, we can move uh, uh, to increase our agricultural export. There are some plans for the, by the Ministry of Food Processing uh, Industries. We are also diversifying our export basket. Just one example, jackfruit and lemons have been exported from Tripura northeast to Germany. And the state produces around 1.33 lakh tons of jackfruit a year. Um, and now this Tripura, Assam, Nagaland, Meghalaya jackfruit is now going to Europe and some of it is going via uh, Bangladesh uh, ports and airports. So from there you go to Bangladesh and fly it out logistically, that is, that is better. The dragon fruit has been for the first time exported from Gujarat to London. So again, the coastal areas can help and from West Bengal to Bari. So that's where the connectivity is going to be uh, important. The manufacturing is where we hope we can increase our our share. In services trade, uh, it is in the transport area that 
our ports and our airlines are not carrying enough of India's trade. So modernization of ports, developing transshipment points, uh, increasing the scale so we can have more efficient equipment, uh, corporatizing our ports, private sector participation, um, and uh, promotion of flagging of merchant ships in India uh, for the Indian shipping. All of those can help. Same thing with travel. We have, uh, uh, we don't have enough of the incoming foreign tourists um, in for our size and our, our uh, amenities. So this is where we are, we are developing now Statue of Unity, now Somnath Temple, Ram, uh, Ram Temple in Ayodhya, uh, elsewhere, more and more iconic uh, tourist, uh, the sites are being developed. Financial services is where we are a net importer and gift Gujarat International Financial Tech City is something that we need to work on more. Uh, by the way, a disclosure, I am on the, uh, I am a advisor to the International Financial Services Centers Authority, whose role is to develop uh, uh, our gift and other financial tech cities uh, around the country. Gift is one right now, but more will be hopefully coming up and to develop the FinTech uh, sector uh, as well. So this has just been set up and I'm part of the advisory group. Okay. We have also been working on reducing trade uh, the improving our trade uh, you know, facilitation. And this is some surveys in which India has done well. We are developing seaweed as a new crop, uh, agri startup, financial services initiatives, rupee and UPI getting international, uh, transaction network services, uh, expanding its presence in India and with the India International Exchange linkages will be uh, another way to reduce financial uh, imports. We have set up uh, or we have allowed new development bank in Gift City. So again, improving our financial services. A lot of our money goes in arbitration maritime arbitration. So the India has set up the maritime arbitration center in Gift City uh, and hopefully that will reduce the imports as well. We need to broaden our FDI though. Our FD cumulative share of FDI till March, 2021, Gujarat 30%, Maharashtra 28%, Karnataka 14%, Delhi 11, Tamil Nadu 4, and U UP 1. So we, we can't, we, it's too few and too concentrated few areas. So hopefully the blue economy, the connectivity, Bharat Mala, all of these will help in uh, expanding the FDI, uh, uh, reduce concentration and uh, <clears throat> and the, uh, improve the FDI uh, flows, both the, and as well as the uh, portfolio flows. So as, as this shows, India has showed improvement in trade uh, facilitation. We also, by the way, it is not well known that cumulative amount of FDI inflows up to March 21 were 763 billion USD. We'll reach USD 1 trillion very soon. And actually we have capacity to double that. Uh, and uh, 
we also have an outbound FTI. So the outbound FTI is increasing as well because we need connections in the other countries for our greater integration with the global economy and for our exports. Okay. So let me just make some, make some concluding remark. I hope you can see how blue economy, Sagarmala related can be used to uh, create policies, initiatives that will improve our trade. India is making a concerted and systemic effort to use its blue economy initiatives and relative connectivity initiatives to create related rather to create new avenues of economic activities and new growth nodes. You know, a lot of uh, potential comes when you have more and more growth, the activity is spread around the state. It is also using this initiative to expand its international trade to new products, new geographies, using additional logistics supply chains to help realize its ambitious goals. The indications are that India is likely to meet its export target of USD 4 billion, the merchandise export in 21-22. Vivek de Broglie has made a persuasive case for reforming institutions to achieve India's goals. He argues, when agendas are drawn up for reform, typically by economists, the institutional setting is often ignored. I have in mind the other two, other than executive organs of the state mentioned in the constitution, the legislator and the judiciary. If these two don't function efficiently, any economist driven reform agenda will perforce be constrained. Yet these rarely figure any reform discourse. And this is these projects, they are coastal developments, other, you know, in 2020, 21, the state legislators on the average met for 18 days. How can we have such low productivity and accountability of state governments. So in the, in the judiciary, we all know how urgently the reform is needed. There needs to be timely and relevant data. So uh, my, my model is the Jal Jeevan Yojana. If you go to their dashboard, it's so detailed and so wonderful to do research. And I'm surprised I don't get more PhD thesis on Jal Jivan Yojana and so on to examine. Uh, it is what is a treasure house of information there for thesis and research. But we need more, better dashboards, better information on Sagar Mala, Bharat Mala, and Udan. I got a lot of this information in a, by searching the newspapers, others, sometimes going on Twitter and so on. So researchers and postgraduate students are strongly urged to undertake data intensive policy relevant research on different aspects of the blue economy and explore linkages with India's international trade. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, and I appreciate your kind uh, opportunity. Namaskar. Thank you very much, Professor Asar, for uh, your extensive discussion on the blue economy, its importance, and its linkage with the international trade. It was really thought-provoking and very much uh, influencing the young mind to think again that how they can do the future research in this particular area. So before taking up uh, some of the questions, let me also invite Professor Praveed Day for his remarks and comments and observations. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bharti, and I congratulate uh, uh, Professor Asar for his extensive presentation. He has covered a wide spectrum on the subject. If I may be a, the education minister of this country, just hypothetically, I would request Professor Asar to write 
convert this PowerPoint into a book, it could easily go as a term paper, where to those who are studying MPhil PhD in international trade, international economics, international relations. So rich for this presentation, he has covered uh, one side, it is international trade. I see this, he has a slides on foreign trade. At the same time, linking it with a very, very micro, very narrow details like you know, port development, connective coastal uh, zone development. He spoke about some of the ports, which is a non-major port, which used to call the minor port in the Gujarat state, Japanese investment. So, and he also talked about trade investment, uh, empirical evidences in India. And overall, it is the blue economy. This very correctly, one third of the, of the global surf, the global space is on, on water. So, so it's so important. And I can see his mind that, you know, that this subject was overlooked previously. And, uh, and it is very important now in India. And I see some of the countries in the IOR, and I was told that they have the blue economy ministry in some of the, so, so that's what's importance some of the countries they have taken up in the port based development and, and its, its uh, implications uh, for, uh, for the uh, international trade as Professor Asar has presented in his extensive presentations. I have some, uh, I mean, as I've seen, I, I'm, I'm highly motivated by his presentation because he is ending, he has a very strong introduction as ending as a great professor with, uh, footnotes as well as the bibliography and a concluding remarks normally we don't do that so 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 I, this is this is where you know the completeness of this presentation of the subject which he you know elaborated in, in his 45 minutes presentation but i may add some of the points because i look at uh, international trade integrations regional cooperation and integration in particular from these part of the world uh, and uh, whatever India has been doing in terms of connectivity with the neighborhood and within the country in terms of development of infrastructure, connecting one part of the uh, one part of India with another part with Bharat Mala, Sagar Mala, projects like Uran and so on and so forth. There are so many things are going you know, in, in the country. And this is the first time uh, I've seen for the last five years, the numbers indicates it is almost the 10% average 10% of the national GDP is going into infrastructure development. That's what, which is used to be four to 5%. And there was a great paper by, uh, in, in, in my organization by Professor Ram Gopal Agarwala, which uh, Professor Mukula sir, sir knows him very well. So he was playing with this number that, that if the GDP as in contribution to the infrastructure development goes for 10%, then this will have very strong non-linear impact on the development. That's what I think so many things are, you know, Professor Asar has presented. So let me, let me see some of the points from my side that where, you know, some more can be added, but some, somewhere, you know, Professor Asar may consider to restructure or recast some of the focus of uh, in some part of the, his presentation. Everything, I will look at it more in terms of cost, in terms of trade in, in when, uh, because how uh, this infrastructure development, which he is alluded to this road, highway, railways, inland waterways, even his folk, that how much they are going to reduce our cost of transportation and improve the timeliness. This is what we have to add. Professor Asar has added that in the, at the end when he talked about trade facilitation, but I would request him that if he can bring that element, that cost and time, and it is possible without doing any kind of an econometric modeling, it is possible with some new numbers that's available uh, in, in, in several public domain. Uh, just to add it here, the cost and, and time, uh, and Professor Asar may consider that in our land border, uh, there is a phenomenal progress has been done by this government. And the project was initiated by the previous government before 2014. 
the project is so useful that normally, you know, in a democratic setup, what was done by the previous government, the government next, they don't follow it. Sometime, you know, they leave aside, they take their own projects ahead, but this case, it just didn't happen. What is that project? When you talk about timeliness, development of the border connectivity, this is Land Port Authority of India, LPAI, is under the Ministry of Home Affairs. What LPI does, they manages all our entry and exit point, which used to be known, P2012, called ICS, uh, sorry, LCS, Land Customs Station. Now they are known as Integrated Check Post, ICP. So if you go to Atari, which is handling our cargo with the Afghanistan and Pakistan, or if you come to More, which is handling our cargo with Myanmar and ASEAN countries, or a Petrapol, or maybe it rocks all. So these are the places, you know, uh, where you will see that this infrastructure was actually heavily developed and put in, in under one roof. Our, our previous cases, it is our land port. It's not like an airport. When you land into a seaport or an airport, you will get everything at in near, near to you, kind of a single window. But when you go to the land side, because of our, you know, colonial structure, the immigration is one place, warehouse is another place, uh, your entry point is another place, the gate, exit gate is another place, everything is scattered. Now, this has changed. Everything now put it in one place. So you enter from one point, exit from other side. So this is, the, this is done by uh, Land Port Authority of India uh, under the Ministry of Home Affairs. And presently, seven ICPs at a different location of the Indian land post, land border, they are under operations. 2012, uh, the, uh, these LPAI, in short, they were introduced by an act in the parliament 2010. To next year, they will be celebrating 10 years. So, so this part, maybe you would like to add, uh, you know, that our land border and how they have changed. As you can understand that India's trade in the neighborhood, it's basically rooted through, if you leave aside Maldives or Sri Lanka, by land. So this is very important. And I can share some of the statistics that I have, you know, with the LPAI, how, how many cargo it, it, it handles, how much trade it handles. And as a matter of fact, over time, this trade through the ICPs has actually increased heavily from less than 30% of India's trade in the neighborhood to more than 63%. So this is one point when it comes to cost and time is concerned. Now, the one which I think, you know, I also have to mention here, if you look at a Google map, uh, India in a Google map and Google Earth, and if you zoom in, then you will see that Eastern part of India is actually, uh, they're quite fortunate to have a deep drafted, you know, uh, uh, the coastline than the western side. I was told by some uh, maritime experts in ASEAN that ASEAN, Southeast Asia's beautiful beaches are in the east coast than in the west side. Malaysia, Thailand, those are great examples. Why it is in the east, why not in the west? I was told western side, there are a lot of resources that have been exploited like oil, gas. That is why the beaches are polluted. Eastern side is not that. So you will get beautiful um, the seasides in the east. So that's what an explanation I've given, but it, it needs something more. So what I'm trying to tell you that east coast of India, you know, there are ample opportunities for development, which is not happening at the moment, all going to focus on the western side because of the clustering industries, FDI, in the Gujarat, in the Maharashtra. Uh, but eastern side, which is much closer to the Bay of Bengal, You are in Singapore, you have so many, so many students you have trained. And so maybe this part in the east coast of India. East Asia and, and many parts, the rest of the world, you know, you, you may like to add here, you know, how we develop east coast of India. Relatively speaking, these are the important which will bring uh, to our states, the provinces which are relatively declining compared to um, uh, the Western side. If you look at the state-wise uh, distribution of the regional economies, Western economies and Delhi uh, clusters, they are going much faster than the Eastern, Northeastern side. So probably the port-based development 
um, might need, you know, this kind of a rethinking, if you'd like to give additional thrust to our states, which is in the east and northeastern side. Last point from my side is uh, that there is a huge cost India has been playing. You know, I'm not arguing is it good or bad, going to Singapore and going to Colombo for transshipment. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an issue. Some of those are nationalists. They say, why should we go to Colombo and uh, Singapore? Why not we do the transshipment by ourselves? But the fact that we don't have deep drafted port and the mainline shipping channels from east to west and west to east are a bit far away. And the facilities, the environment that Sri Lanka and Singapore offer to the shipping liners, which we cannot. Uh, and they don't have you know, cabotage, they have a very relaxed uh, environment. So here, uh, maybe when you talk about port-based development and, um, and its, it's international trade, uh, can you suggest something that how do we have this regional maritime cooperation between Indian ports in the, and the ports transshipment like in Singapore or in, in Colombo or Port Klang in Malaysia or somewhere in, in, in the South Asia? Because these is, you know, India, uh, Southeast Asia maritime cooperation is very important. And if you recall uh, that our, prime, our Honorable Prime Minister spoke at UNSC just a few days back, and his speech is a great speech, which is delivered at UNSC. Uh, it is all about maritime connectivity, maritime cooperation, maritime security, maritime safety, which is very much integrated you know, to your presentation. So this one, I would request you to bring uh, some recommendations uh, that how long in the China must have been stopped investing in the port sector. You have a slide, uh, the 2005 to 2019, and the rank of the world ports, it is no more the European. It is the, the Asian ports are coming in the top in so far the country is concerned. It is no more Singapore, it's a China port. But China uh, investing uh, to port, seaport, not much. So where is China investing? That's what uh, somebody explained to me. China is investing more into the airport. Uh, why? Because because China will be exporting more and more capital-intensive good. China will be exporting more high-value, low-weight goods than Indian, Southeast Asia, or African countries. Our export compositions, when you said about diversification, very right. Our export composition is, this is low-value, high-weight, you know, the things that we export. And this will transform when we start exporting capital-intensive good as the way China is doing. So when it is high value, low weight, it is easy to ship it by air than ocean. So, so new ship order at Koreans, which is a post, post Panamax, which is 50,000 plus container order has been declined, not just because of the COVID led global slowdown, even then, and there is a huge amount of activities going on by the Boeing and Airbus to have a bigger airlines, bigger aircraft to carry the cargo to faster from one place to another place. Uh, this is what I, I, I think the interesting part. So India will be looking that as well, going to you know, that direction. Perhaps you may like to add something, the trade-off between India's port-led uh, international trade and development from, uh, for, from ocean cargo to air cargo port or seaport or airport. That's what you know, I would like to have an answer in your paper. Otherwise, it is an excellent piece. We will be looking forward, we are looking forward to your paper. And when you convert this, I'll be happy to read it once again and come back to you with, uh, you know, uh, with, again to you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dave. Uh, we are also having, uh, uh, Dr. George Joan, former Vice Chancellor, uh, Virsa Agricultural University, Rachi, and uh, former Senior Advisor and Scientist, Department of Biotechnology with us. So uh, I would also like to uh, invite him for his comments, if, if possible, uh, if he can share some of the comments. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, it's been a pleasure to listen to Professor Mukul. I enjoyed the lecture. 
It has been a very comprehensive thing. And as Professor Day said, we would like to have further inputs from you on this. Well, incidentally, uh, he, he also mentioned the various working group reports for the Economic Advisory Council to the PM. Incidentally, I chaired the working group three report, which dealt with marine fisheries processing and related issues. Now, we have, we have looked at the sector very carefully and keeping in view the requirements of fish in the future, we said that up to 5 million metric tons can be produced through mariculture, provided there is proper planning and you can use only a small segment of your ocean resources for that. Now, that calls for an integrated approach because there are multi-user issues waterways, I mean, places where vessels move. There are again, traditional uh, fishers, traditional fishermen, all these issues can be taken into consideration in a holistic manner, but we do have a huge, huge potential out there. And India needs to move decisively and decisively in this direction. Associated with it also, you have the, uh, the sanctity of the resources, for instance, pollution affecting plastic pollution. Now, nobody has really mapped these things, you know. I feel that these are huge, huge problems. We really don't know what will happen in the next uh, 10 years or 15 years. What could be the effect of plastics, microplastics? So that mapping has to be done in a very comprehensive manner. Quite often, when you look at production, you go in a one track mind and say, produce all the fish that we need, but the fish is being produced at what cost? So these are ecological costs, economic costs, sociological costs, all these things have to be taken into consideration. Nevertheless, I would emphatically insist that we need to increase our production from the mariculture sector. So these are some of the directions that some of the suggestions that we have made and also exploiting the ocean resources for marine biotechnology application, the non food sector of biological resources. I know Singapore has done a lot. Sir, you have been in Singapore. Uh, I have a friend of mine, Dr. Venkatesh, Dr. Venkatesh, who's working, who was in the National University of Singapore, a marine uh, biotechnology man. We were colleagues at one time in India and he moved over to <laughs> Singapore. So I was there a couple of years ago, I was there, I met him. So there are so many of these newer areas, for instance, uh, you're looking at the non-living sector of the biological resources, enzymes, you can develop biologicals, you can develop nanotechnology, biomaterial based on marine biology, you know. So there are a large number of options that are available. In fact, I have been personally pushing for a great, I mean, a, a, an institute in India exclusively devoted for marine biotechnology applications. And I believe that the new project, the deep sea mission, a major program approved by the government of India will have this component also as a separate institution coming up. So it's it's kind of a, <laughs> a dream come true. <laughs> I've been pursuing it for the last 15 years or so. Finally, it's taking some shape. But what I'm trying to say is that we need to do much more than what we are doing and make use of newer technologies to do this. So I'm happy that uh, you have touched upon many of these things, sir. And I look forward to being able to contribute in whatever uh, manner is possible. Thank you. Let me once again say that I really enjoyed your lecture. A very, very revealing, thought-provoking lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, Professor uh, Asar, if you have any comment on some of the observations made by Professor Day and also by uh, uh, Professor John. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the Professor Day has made some very valuable, insightful observations. I would request him to share the land control, uh, the data that, you know, the development uh, 
uh, that that has that has occurred, uh, and certainly I would be wanting to know more uh, more about that. Uh, my main objective was to link the blue economy, Sagarmala, and and the trade. So the the border control was not as uh, central to it, but it's an important point I would I would be wanting to uh, include uh, as I further work work on this. Thank you also for pointing out uh, Ram Gopal Agarwala's uh, paper on infrastructure, and I hope. Dr. Day and I can communicate uh, by email and share uh, ideas and material. Thank you, Dr. John, for that you chaired that uh, on the on the fisheries sector and the maritime. What you suggested as a center is something uh, that is uh, long long overdue uh, in the country. And I'm, uh, I had not studied the report that you shared, uh, but now I will you have aroused my curiosity. And, uh, and I would certainly be advocating what you have just said about the new center. Yes, thank you very much. And I appreciate the comments from both of you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, sir, we have a few questions now. Uh, Dr. Arjun, have you also received few questions? Because I have I have uh, one or two questions in my chat box, yeah. So one of the question right now is, a large part of foreign trade through ports takes place from Mumbai. How do we develop and strengthen new ports in the country? especially in light of the recent history of failures of special economic zones. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, in Mumbai, there are two ports. There's a Mumbai port. I grew up next to Mumbai port, okay, behind CST. Uh, that is not a very big port now. Um, JNPT is. So JNPT is in Mumbai, but as I said, the largest port today is Mundra by volume. And what we are doing is di diversifying, developing, and we had not uh, really paid too much emphasis on modernization and investment. So the infrastructure investment that is going on, we are going to see much greater diversification of the cargo. I remember many years ago in the 90s, I was an advisor to Singapore delegation and came with a minister to India uh, from Singapore as, as their advisor. And we went to the Madras port. And the way that we saw Madras port functioning at the time, it was very clear that they needed to invest a lot in physically, in human resources, in organizationally, in the IT and other software and so on. So now that that investment is taking place, we are going to see diversification. The other reason was that our trade volume was relatively small, even though it is 1,200 billion, uh, in, uh, it should be around 2 trillion over the next few years. Uh, the, and Mumbai, Maharashtra is the most important uh, industrial state. It has the largest GSDP uh, and, and so on. And a lot of activity took place. So a lot of uh, things went through, through there. But I have seen in uh, and, and talked to many who before used to send to JNPT their cargo for trade or receive imports at JNPT are no longer doing so. They are going to the Gujarat ports and somewhere in the south, those who are 
located in the south. So Mumbai won't be JNPT rather, rather than Mumbai, won't be as dominant as it used to be for a variety of reasons. Yeah, we have uh, one more question uh, by the uh, on the Q and yes. Yeah. So, Dr. Kumar, you were saying something. I was saying, sir, in the Q and A, there are two three questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, one of the attendee he has not declared his name, but he has uh, uh, written that Professor Rasar, thank you for such an engaging session. Would like to know your thoughts. On the, uh, on, the, on the climate crisis as a consideration in the expansion of India's foreign trade. What are the prospects of making the expansion a suitable one alongside? Does the component of safety also assume greater importance in light of the Gulf of Mexico fire and the recent IPCC report being leveled a code red for humanity? One of the important lessons that study of economics and study of public policy teaches you, you us rather, is the need for trade-offs at different levels, at different times, we make different trade-offs uh, and we now have uh, the, we have uh, international solar organization. We are meeting Paris, the climate goals uh, and so on. And you are of course right that whatever we do, we need to take into account the sustainability, environmental sustainability. Uh, but environmental sustainability is not the only goal. And if, if the, at a $2,000 per capita income, when we want to go to 10,000, your, your policy making thinking about trade-offs and risk are different than when you are Norway with 5 million people, lot of oil and 65,000 per capita income. You can afford to have different trade-offs than we can. So let's be not romantic. Let's not take other people's agenda on our, the, uh, the international community can say what they want to say, but we need to make our own policies for our own context, make the trade-offs that are needed, mindful that if there is a huge environmental crisis, in globally, we will be affected, but our contribution so far has been relatively small per capita. I didn't show you, but I have a slide that says from 1750 to today, which countries have contributed the most to the greenhouse gases? The US uh, and others, China, they have contributed a lot. So it's not that we shouldn't take it into account, but you have to balance and make choices, use technology, and we are making progress in that direction as well. Look at our renewable energy, how much we are doing uh, uh, progress in, in the renewable energy. As I said, Indian railways will be carbon neutral in, by the end of this decade. Could we ever thought that Indian railway will be carbon neutral. So yes, we are taking into account where we can, but we can't give up our goals. We need to grow per capita income. Growth is an imperative if we want to get, give our people good life. Well, we, have, if we can also take all the questions together, it will be it will <laughs> take some time. Yes, any questions? <laughs> Yes, Sorry, yes. My, mine is a typical academic who answers the question <laughs> in a yes, long sir, way. We will call it quite a few. Yes, so, yes so We please. have three more questions. So the first one is, what is your view on India's seaweed industry? Uh, then the second question is, 
uh, can you please throw some more light on trade facilitation initiatives taken by India? In addition, if we want to go for quantitative research, will it be possible to measure progress of Sagarmala program? And the third question is, uh, could you please elaborate the circumstances under which India decided not to join the RCEP? Okay. So these are the three questions. One, one more question is there, sir. In the chat box? Yes. Uh, that question was, uh, oh, just, just. So that has come just to me. How does uh, sir see development in trade efficiency? competitiveness and the logistics ease of doing business when compared to other East Asian countries in China. And so what are your views in the recent infrastructure push by uh, the, our Indian government on Gati Shakti, national infrastructure, pipeline and others? There has been also a shift towards export-led devel uh, development, especially from the uh, regions and district level, especially during the Atmir package and all uh, things during the last year. Sir, over to you. These are very wide ranging uh, questions. And sometimes the answers are not so simple that can be said in yes, no, or a couple of sentences. Uh, I'll try to be as responsive as I can. Our seaweed industry is very important, but we right now produce around 20,000 tons, I think, of seaweeds. We want to produce 1.1 million tons over the next five to eight years. The cabinet has passed the program, budget has been allocated, and we will move towards greater uh, contribution of seaweeds to the, to the uh, economy. It will have also, address our malnutrition problem. India's problem is no longer hunger, it's malnutrition. How do we fortify rice, how do we fortify food? And seaweed is an excellent uh, uh, source for protein and so on. Uh, the RCAP uh, is, a, is a complex thing, but it's, it's not in our interest. To, to, to join ARSA. Uh, if you look at the countries, uh, you know, the, in all of these, there is no implementation integrity. If some country like China is not implementing the agreement in the spirit it was, it is signed, who is going to have a dispute resolution with them? There is no dispute resolution mechanism. And the, we already have bilateral agreements like with ASEAN, with individual ASEAN countries. And now we are fast tracking uh, trade agreements with six countries, including UAE, which is a large trading partner, UK, which is a new partner uh, in, in terms of agreement and other that we, you know, we, we don't need to just join uh, for the sake of joining. The marginal benefit is small because all the RCEP countries have got enough agreements with each other. The more agreements you have, the higher the transaction cost. And it is not a, in our national interest to join RCEP at this point in time unless our uh, concerns are, are, are met. About the GATI and all the other infrastructure, uh, see, we are going towards investment-led economic growth. We have been spending, uh, putting too much on consumption. And the all the countries, uh, if I digress, if we look at historically the countries that have grown, it's only about 40 year period in which they grew very rapidly. Then they sort of become normal countries. And in those 40 year period, the investment to GDP ratio is somewhere between 35 and 40%. Ours was 30 to 32%. And at some time it was 34. Now we are going to 35, 
4D range. And that range we need to continue so that investment growth is helping. Export, we have to do it at the margin because the key part of it is that unless we are able to supply what the world needs, we are relevant to the world and secure what we need as imports. We can't be a major country. So the Atman Airport Bharat is often misunderstood and I've written enough and given enough talks on that to show that it really will integrate India even more deeply. And so all of these uh, initiatives are towards, towards that. I gave you some surveys of the trade facilitation and I read a very interesting thesis by a student of Professor Nalin Bharti on trade facilitation. Uh, and um, India is making quiet progress, but we still need to go get down and try, uh, you know, we, we, we are a large country. There are many uh, uh, trade facilitation points. Uh, I mentioned about the fact that uh, for the states, many, most states do not have formal statutes that are coded. We have India low code, low code, but not states. And we are wor working on that. So part of all that is a work in progress, but there is recognition. But with the trade facilitation is helpful only if we have capabilities to do trading. <laughs> And we have the connectivity. We have got all the things that we were talking about, the blue economy, new manufacturing, coastal zones, investments, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, so, so we need to look at it in connection with that. Have I missed out anything? I hope not. Yeah, thank you for taking up all the questions. <laughs> Professor A uh, and uh, Professor uh, Asar, and uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. John, uh, I think uh, uh, since now we are approaching dinner time, so uh, if we can take uh, two minutes uh, uh, way ahead uh, in terms of our, our discussion that what we can uh, take home, uh, uh, if we can, uh, we can take up major, uh, major points, uh, summarizing in two minutes, it will be great for all the participants to, uh, to just uh, rethink about what can be done in future and uh, what type of new policies can be also formulated to support the ongoing reforms and the reforms which has to be done in future. So two minutes uh, by Professor Asher and two minutes uh, okay. by Professor uh, Thank you, Professor Bharti. I think... Uh, my slides were fairly comprehensive, but if I have to emphasize something, it is that the concept of blue economy is still not as much known as uh, it should be. And it is our duty as researchers in the think tanks, as academics uh, and so on, to guide the next generation as well in the importance of how India can strategize blue economy along with Bharat Mala and other complementary programs to create new growth nodes, new livelihood opportunities, like seaweed will create huge livelihood opportunities and raise incomes because it can be done as a, uh, farmers can do it as non-farming income uh, as well. Um, uh, and, and so on. So I think that we have to be positive with the mindset that India should be and wants to be and is mentally and uh, ready with capabilities to become a major country in the world. This is what I saw in my teaching in all these years, that when the Chinese students, for example, when they first came to me, you know, they were, they were each class had Chinese students, few of them, 
And in the 80s and early 90s, I didn't get a feeling they have internalized that they want to be a world power. But my 90, mid, late 90s, and then 200, 2000 onwards, it was clear to me they had internalized. And a lot of their actions were there. So we should never be thinking, oh, we are a third world country, we are low income, and country like India and all that. Don't use those words. We want to be a major country. What do we need to do to become one and keep all our thoughts, actions, and positivity rather than going to the negativity in that direction? That will be my larger message. Yeah, thank you very much. Professor Day, uh, may I also request to you to... Yeah, I have nothing to summarize. I was actually looking at it. Professor Asa's paper. So my uh, conclusions uh, would be that we are looking forward to read his paper out of this uh, huge PowerPoint slides, which he presented the story, which he has presented to us. So we look forward to read the, the full paper and this will be very useful also to get you know, young minds on the subject. Presently, as Professor Asar rightly said, there are not many research is going on in academics, in think tanks on the blue economy. He, he said that, I think with some frustration, that uh, the blue economy concept, engaging the government and different agencies in the blue economy is not there somehow. So, so uh, the paper which he will be writing, and uh, this will actually encourage many young scholars to work on the subject in future. So look forward to read his uh, the book or the, uh, the monograph, which he's planning to write out of this PowerPoints. Thank you very much. Also welcome him to come to in India very often so that we can get an opportunity to interact with him uh, and uh, visit the country, encourage young scholars. <laughs> and then, you know, this would be a great opportunity for us to get benefited out of his knowledge and great experience he has. Thank you very much. Namaskar. It would be a pleasure. Dr. John, would you like to have some, some points from your side also? I think I have I've mentioned those points. I would emphasize on just two words, concerted action, you know, because we talk of uh, many things, we have identified all our issues, we know what should be done, but when we actually do it, we should do it with a kind of one track mind, I would say that. And that is required for all the, all the sectors that we have identified. So let us emphasize on that. And let us also keep a close watch on what is happening in the country as a follow-up to all these recommendations, because it is necessary to take them forward. I know that uh, the concept and the blueprint has been developed and the government is actively pursuing it, but we should also, as academicians and researchers, we should also keep a close watch on what's happening and lend a helping hand wherever it is possible to make sure that the action is concerted. Thank you. So uh, an important point which was also highlighted by Professor Asar in his uh, presentation is how uh, the states like Uttar Pradesh is receiving hardly 1% of FDI and uh, how uh, there is a uh, inequality in terms of getting FDI in India. This is also one of the major uh, point, uh, uh, which which brings uh, a, a grassroots level uh, change if we have to really think for making India as a destination for FDI. So, so uh, we we saw that India has received a huge FDI and we are the only country during COVID-19 period uh, to receive a bulk of FDI. But still, if we go inside the FDI recipient, uh, there are many states, uh, they are still without getting uh, foreign direct investment. And uh, we know that uh, there is a direct link between the FDI and the uh, production and the trade. Uh, and we cannot ignore that without getting FDI, 
uh, largest populated states will really come up with new opportunities in terms of employment, especially COVID-19, post-COVID-19 unemployment is one of the major issues for the states. So uh, bringing blue economy on the track, uh, having more investment uh, uh, in terms of foreign direct investment or also the investment within the country and linking those investment and the production network uh, through uh, international trade is the need of the hour. Post COVID-19 situation is more uh, challenging for all of us, especially for country which has larger population, more in the informal sector uh, employment. Uh, there, is a, there is a high task for all of us to think on. So I understand uh, Professor Asar's lecture uh, that uh, this type of, uh, uh, this type of uh, discussion is going to bring India uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a very dynamic, uh, uh, dynamic world while uh, we are looking for the foreign investment. We are also bringing the new opportunities for the investors. At the same time, uh, we have the potential to fulfill the gap of the production as well as the employment within and outside the country. And uh, we cannot really, uh, uh, we cannot really uh, make India uh, Atmanirvar without making other countries also uh, Atmanirvar. So I feel, I feel that if, if we have to really, uh, really make the world happy and prosperous, India will be a partner and becoming a partner when a country had different challenges inside, uh, there, is a, there is a need to invest in blue economy. There is a need to rethink about the ports infrastructure and trade facilitation. Improving those aspects are very, very important point, which has been highlighted by Professor Rasar and supported by Professor Praveed Day and, and uh, Dr. John. So I would like, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Arjun for uh, giving us the opportunity for all of us to share a very recent and very uh, motivating topic for all of us. Uh, and uh, now I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Arjun if he has any point to make. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's quite a long session, uh, but I do, will be very happy, as Professor Dave was suggesting, for the manuscript out of the PowerPoint presentation really updated. So we'll be so happy to publish it as a working paper or a book, if you find time also to share that with us. And uh, with that, <laughs> with that, I would uh, now like to invite Anshula Mehta, who is Senior Assistant Director at Impli, to formally propose the vote of thanks. Anshula, go ahead. Uh, so on behalf of the IMPRI Center for the Study of Finance and Economics, I would like to formally thank all of you for joining us for today's Web Policy Talk. Thank you, Professor Mukul Ashar, for taking out the time to be with us in this inaugural session of our series, The State of Foreign Trade, Hashtag Talking Trade, and delivering such an insightful and enriching presentation on the blue economy, port-based development, and expanding India's foreign trade. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nalin Bharti, for joining us as the moderator for the session. We are also grateful to Professor Prabir Day for joining us as a discussant and for sharing his perspectives, and also to Dr. George John for joining us on the panel and sharing his comments on the topic. Thank you, sir. And thank you, of course, to uh, the audience who watched us here on Zoom or on Facebook Live and raised such pertinent questions. And thank you if you are watching later on YouTube or listening to us on our podcast. We hope that you continue to tune in to future episodes of Talking Trade. And with that, I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.